Hi. Today we're going to be talking about different types of covalent bonds. Now, as a quick review, you guys know that an ionic bond is when there is a transfer of electrons. One loses, one gains, one becomes positive, one becomes negative, and they stick together. And that's pretty much it. You either lose or you gain. There's no middle ground there. But when we start talking about covalent bonds, that's where we're sharing electrons. The electrons are bouncing around between the different valence shells. And we can have different types of sharing that creates different types of covalent bonds. There's pretty much one type of ionic bond, but we're going to break down covalent bonds into two different categories. The first category is called the nonpolar covalent bond. And I'll explain what this term nonpolar means. Um, it makes more sense after we go through the second type. But it is still a covalent bond, so we're still talking about sharing electrons. In a covalent bond, we have two atoms that have the exact same electronegativity. They have the exact same pulling ability. For example, let's take hydrogen and hydrogen. If you look up the electronegativity of hydrogen, it's about 2.2. And the other hydrogen is also 2.2. So if these two guys were having a tug of war for the electrons, no one would really win because they're both pulling with the same ability, the same strength. So if we take a look at the two electrons, and these two electrons, of course, are moving around, they're not standing here, they spend equal amount of time around each hydrogen atom. Since both atoms pull the electron with the same strength, the electrons spend equal time in each valence shell. So let's watch how these electrons bounce around. They're going to bounce together as a pair. And first they're over there, then there, then there. They're just hopping back and forth. They're spending equal amounts of time around this guy and equal amounts of time around this guy. So a nonpolar covalent bond is when you have the electrons shared equally. Shared covalent. Shared equally nonpolar covalent. There's no separation of charge. Neither one of these atoms gets the electron more often. Neither one loses the electron more often. So they pretty much stay at a neutral charge. And that means because there's no separation of charge, there's no positive end, there's no negative end. Now, this part down here seems a little confusing right now. But when we compare it to the second type of covalent bond, it's going to make a lot more sense. Our second type of bond is the polar covalent bond. And in a polar covalent bond, we have nonmetals with different electronegativities. It's got to be nonmetals because they're covalently bonding. We'll talk about that in a minute. But they're going to have slightly different electronegativities. So let's take, for example, carbon versus oxygen. These two will bond together and share a pair of electrons. But since carbon's got a pulling ability of 2.6, that's its electronegativity, oxygen has an electronegativity much higher, 3.4. So these electrons are going to be attracted more towards the oxygen than the carbon. So if we just started marking where the electrons exist at a particular time, you would see that the oxygen spends more time, the oxygen spends more time with those two electrons and the carbon has less time with those two electrons. So I'm just going to draw circles saying the electrons around the oxygen, the oxygen, the oxygen. It's moving around the oxygen. But once in a while it goes back to the carbon, but it spends most of its time around the oxygen. So the oxygen has the electrons more often. It has gained the electrons more often. The carbon has lost the electrons. Not all the time, but more often. Since the oxygen has the two electrons more, it's usually negative. Every time the electrons are spending time around the oxygen, the oxygen now has an extra electron that's negative, and the carbon is missing an electron, so it's positive. But since it doesn't have the electron all the time, we can't say it's got a negative charge. We say it has a partial negative charge. Okay, And that's the symbol for a partial negative right there. So the way you make a partial negative is if you draw kind of like an S and then just continue the catch up the bottom part here, or draw an 8 but don't finish it up here, that's actually what's called a lowercase delta. 
and it means partial. So we can say it's partially negative. And since the carbon has lost the electrons more often, it's usually positive. Not completely positive because it gets the electron back every now and again, but we say that it is partially positive. So now let's review. So now let's review. What is a polar covalent bond? There is unequal sharing of electrons. The electrons spend more time around one atom than around the other. Because of this, there's charges. There's a separation of charge. You can see that since the oxygen gets the electron more often, it's partially negative. The carbon has lost its electron more often, it's partially positive. So there's a positive side and a negative side. And that's what we mean by a separation of charge. The bond has a positive end and the bond has a negative end. The positive end is always going to be the side with the lower electronegativity because it loses the electrons. And the negative side is always going to be the side with the higher electronegativity. It gains the electrons more often. Now, we've got three different types of bonds. How can we just look at atoms and say, here's the type of bond it's going to be? Well, there's a couple of ways of doing it. First of all, let's talk about the general rule. Generally, what will an atom do if it has a particular number of valence electrons? If it has one or two or three valence electrons, it's, a, it's very hard for these atoms to gain electrons to get an octet. So what they'll do is they'll lose their electrons either all the time, ionic bond, or most of the time, polar covalent bond. Usually these guys lose their electrons all the time, but once in a while they can be involved in a polar covalent situation. So they end up giving up electrons. If you've got four valence electrons, you're kind of right in the middle. It's just as hard to gain four more as it is to lose four more. So what these guys will do is they will share electrons, either in a polar covalent bond or a nonpolar covalent bond. Some form of covalent bonding. And if you have five, six, or seven valence electrons, now you have close to an octet. Now it's much easier for the element to gain electrons either all the time, ionic bond, or part of the time, polar covalent bond. And finally, of course, if you have eight valence electrons, well, you're a noble gas. You don't need to bond. You've got your complete octet. But as you can see from this, it's a general rule. It doesn't tell us specifically what type of bond. It's ionic or polar covalent. Or when, when does it happen to be nonpolar covalent? We need a little bit more. We need to use a slightly different method to figure out what type of bonding there is. One way that we're going to start off learning is how to tell electronegativity, how to tell what type of bond it is based on electronegativity difference. So a while ago, I had you guys do a homework where you took two atoms, wrote down the electronegativity of both of them, then subtracted the big one from the small one. Well, that's how we're going to start predicting what type of bond we have. So. First off, if we subtract the electronegativities and we end up with zero, well, the only way you're going to get zero is if the two atoms have the exact same electronegativity, which means nobody gets the electron more often, which means we have a nonpolar covalent type of bond. Why? Because both electrons are, both atoms are pulling the electrons equally, and so there's going to be equal sharing. If there is a slight difference in electronegativity, what we call a slight difference is anything from 0 up to, but not including, 1.7. Now there's a slight difference. Now one atom is pulling a little harder than the other. The electrons spend more time around one atom versus the other. We call that a polar covalent bond. Why? Because since one atom is a little bit stronger than the other, they have this unequal sharing. And then, of course, if you have an electronegativity difference of 1.7 or more, there's such a huge difference we consider it to be ionic. And in this case, the difference between the two pulling abilities results in the electrons spending all their time around one atom and no time around the other atom. Another way to look at it is in a diagram type thing. Here we go. 
we draw a little diagram here, we put a line here, we say 1.7. If the difference is right at zero, it's a nonpolar covalent bond. If the difference is higher than zero but less than 1.7, it's in this range here, that's a polar covalent bond. And if it's 1.7 or more, that's an ionic bond. Now, this method works for most bonds between atoms. It's a great way to start learning how to predict the different types of bonds. Later on, I'm going to show you a better method, but I do want you to understand that this is all based on the pulling ability of the different atoms. So, let's do some practice. Let's take a look at what we've got here. Between carbon and hydrogen, what type of bond? Use the chart above. Uh, sodium and oxygen and bromine and bromine. So pause for a second and write down what you think is the type of bonding based on the electronegativity difference. Okay. Carbon has an electronegativity difference of 2.6. Hydrogen is 2.2. Subtract those guys and you get 0.4. And 0.4 means it is unequal sharing polar covalent bond. Between sodium and oxygen... 0.9 for sodium and 3.4 for oxygen. And remember, we're getting all of these from table S. If you forgot, we're finding the electronegativities on table S. Subtract these two and we get 2.5, much larger than 1.7, so it's ionic. And the third one, I'm not even going to use table S to figure this out because whatever bromine is, the other bromine's the same. And if I subtract them, I should get zero. Now, in actuality, when you look on table S, bromine and bromine are three, three minus three is zero. They're pulling equally. The electrons are shared equally. That is what we call a nonpolar covalent bond. Now, another way I'm going to ask you this same question is like this. What type of bond in the following compounds? But if I ask you a question like this, you only have one type of bond. For example, in CH4, if you look right here, in CH4, it's carbon bonding to hydrogens. See, there's only one type of bond here, a carbon to hydrogen bond. So what we'll do is we'll take that bond right there and subtract carbon and hydrogen, just the two of them. The fact that there's three other bonds doesn't matter. They're all the same type of bonds. So between carbon and hydrogen, carbon is 2.6. One of the hydrogens is 2.2. Subtract and we get 0.4. And you get yourself a polar covalent bond. With Na2O, there's sodium, there's an oxygen, there's an oxygen. There's only going to be one type of bond between a sodium and an oxygen. Actually, that was two sodiums and an oxygen. We look up one sodium, 0.9, one oxygen, 3.4, difference is 2.5, that's ionic. Again, we're looking at one bond within the molecule, within the substance. In the second one, MgCl2, it's like having an Mg and a chlorine over here and a chlorine over here. The only type of bond we've got going on here is a magnesium to chlorine bond. So I look up one magnesium and one chlorine. Difference is 1.9, and that's an ionic bond. And the last one, water, water's the same way. There's an H, there's an O, there's an H. We've drawn that one a lot of times. So you see there's only one type of bond, an oxygen to hydrogen bond. So I'll take the one oxygen and the one hydrogen, subtract them, and that ends up being a polar covalent bond. One of the last topics we're going to talk about is ionic character. If you look up here, we have an ionic bond and an ionic bond. We have a polar covalent bond and a polar covalent bond. But all bonds, just because they're polar covalent or ionic, some of them are better polar covalent bonds or better ionic bonds. And that's where the term ionic character comes in. Ionic character describes how much like an ionic bond your bond is. Is it a really good ionic bond? Is it a not really good ionic bond? 
And all we have to do is take a look at the electronegativity difference. The bigger this number is, the better of an ionic bond it is. Here it's 0.4. It's, it's not really ionic at all. As a matter of fact, we call it polar covalent. Here it's 2.5. It's ionic because it's above 1.7. This is also ionic, but this has the bigger difference. This is the better ionic bond. This has the most ionic character. Over here, this one has the least ionic character. So, let's take a look at two sets here. Between hydrogen and oxygen or carbon and oxygen, which of these two bonds here has the greater ionic character? Well, if you've got 2.2 and 3.4, and you've got 2.6 and 3.4, the difference here is going to be smaller making this the better ionic bond. Now, neither one of these bonds are actually ionic. They're both polar covalent, but that's closer to being an ionic bond. Now, we'll take a look at these two guys, which I'll tell you right off the bat. These are both ionic. But if you look up sodium chloride, 0.9 and 3.4, oh, 0.9 and 3.2, 0.9 and 3.2, and 0.8 and 3.2, you'll see that this has the bigger difference. Even though they're both ionic, that's a better ionic bond that has more ionic character. So the last thing I want to go through is this idea of the molecule. We said before that ionic things are not considered molecules, but covalently bonded things are considered molecules. Why? How come? What's up with that? The molecules atoms covalently bonded together. The reason behind this is you can actually see sets of atoms in a molecule. If we want to take a look at this chloride ion right here, and let's put it in a sodium chloride compound. Can you tell which chlorine goes with which sodium? It's a little hard to tell whether this chlorine is attracted to this one or that one's attracted to this one. Is this one attracted to this or this or this? We can't see who goes with whom. In fact, Nobody really goes with anybody else. They're like a, a whole bunch of little magnets that are all thrown together. They just all stick to each other. So there's no specific set of atoms in this case. But if we take a look at something like water, we see we have H bonded to O bonded to H, and that's it. Nothing else is bonded to this. So in a sample of water, you'll see a little set of H2O, another little set of H2O, and because you can say this oxygen goes with that and with that and with nothing else, they are specific molecules. So that's about all we have for right now. We've gone through two different types of covalent bonding, the polar covalent bond and the nonpolar covalent bond, and explained how the sharing is different between them. We also took a look at how you can look at two atoms and determine what type of bond is going to exist in each one of them. Now, I'm teaching you the electronegativity method right now, but there's another method coming later on, which is more general, which actually gives us a little bit better results. We also talked about ionic character. Subtract the electronegativity between two atoms, and it tells you how much like an ionic bond it is, how much ionic character it has. The last thing we reviewed was this idea of the molecule, sets of atoms. And you can see in an ionic substance like NaCl, there is no specific set of atoms. But in a covalently bonded substance like H2O, we can see sets of atoms. So there we go. Anything sounds confusing? Please send me an email and let me know.